good morning welcome to all of you for this hyderabad lecture series and i request the dean of the school of life sciences to accompany with the honorable vice chancellor and the guest of the day professor irvin neher may i ask them to come to the dais please I request the vice chancellor to take the proceedings. Good morning, everybody. Welcome you back for this Hyderabad lecture series at University of Hyderabad. We are very happy that we are able to have the second lecture. by another nobel laureate today we had a wonderful talk yesterday and we have our distinguished speaker to talk to us this morning i would like to first extend a warm welcome to our speaker professor neher for accepting our invitation at a short notice and also making it possible to visit hyderabad and then deliver this lecture at university of hyderabad under hyderabad lecture series i also would like to thank professor eva maria she is another distinguished scientist accompanying her husband but in her own capacity she is a highly distinguished scientist and doing wonderful things at gottingen I extend a warm welcome to you also professor Eva Maria. As I told yesterday this particular Hyderabad lecture series is meant for disseminating the knowledge and inviting distinguished people to deliver lectures for the benefit of the community at Hyderabad. as part of these lectures now we are having this third nobel laureate speaking to us we have people from different institutions institutions who have come here different universities have come here and we have officials from irda that is institutes regulatory and development authority of india who have been the sponsors of this event in in uh, in a way by setting up an endowment they are also here so we have a diversity of audience diversity of, uh, uh, of cutting across disciplines people have come from different places and uh, it is not possible for me to extend welcome to each and every group separately therefore i take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to everyone who is here with us in this room and in the neighboring room and also those who are watching this live telecast live streaming of this lecture hyderabad lecture series i welcome everyone for this lecture i also want to again emphasize and inform every one of you that this has become possible for us to have the distinguished speaker with us because of the hyderabad lecture endowment that we have with the university of hyderabad this endowment was set up in 2013 by insurance regulatory and development authority of india and we all thank irda for sponsoring this for setting up this endowment and facilitating this kind of interaction and facilitating the opportunity uh, giving an opportunity for all of us in hyderabad and also those who are watching us from elsewhere to have this great opportunity for all of us let us thank them once again i would 
not like to take more time, but it is also important for me to inform that this university has been a highly reputed university in the country, and uh, we have always been in the top ranking institutions in the country. And we are among the few institutions which figure in the world ranking. Therefore, we always take pride that University of Hyderabad has always achieved excellence so far, and in fact, we are now moving towards eminence. As part of this, I should also make a mention, uh, without taking too long, just one point I want to mention, that the, in an exercise that we have done recently about the contributions made by University of Hyderabad faculty, particularly in research, we have realized close to 300,000 times the research work done by University of Hyderabad faculty has been cited in this such. This is a remarkable achievement for any university in the country, and we are proud of it. And we are now proud to have a Nobel laureate who is going to speak to us. I don't want to take a stand between you and our distinguished speaker, but before that, only a few minutes I would like to request Dean School of Life Sciences. Very few minutes, sir. I don't want too long about the School of Life Sciences because it is a, a general lecture uh, that we are uh, eagerly waiting to listen to Professor Nehar. Please, just a couple of minutes. So let me join the Vice Chancellor in extending you a warm welcome to this uh, Hyderabad lecture series uh, on behalf of the School of uh, Life Sciences. It is indeed a great pleasure to honor uh, and honor to have uh, the distinguished speaker, uh, the Nobel Laureate, uh, uh, Professor Erwin uh, Neher and uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Neher with us uh, and uh, to get deliver the uh, distinguished lecture under this uh, Hyderabad lecture series. And the School of Life Sciences, uh, as uh, our uh, Vice Chancellor was pointing out, is one of the largest uh, in the country. Uh, the faculty working in divergent areas of biology and biotechnology, and uh, we all we contribute to the growth of uh, this university in terms of the research, uh, both. Uh, having national and international interactions uh, with various institutions and also with the industry. It is a, indeed a great pleasure to have uh, this uh, distinguished lecture, uh, uh, to host this lecture in the School of Life Sciences. I welcome you all again. Thank you. All of us require of course, may not require an introduction, but it is customary to have an introduction of a distinguished speaker, for which I will be requesting Professor Ramaya from Department of Biochemistry to introduce the speaker to all of us. Before that, I want to make one important point. While University of Hyderabad is hosting, and IRDA has been the supporter, or has, been, has set up the endowment for this lecture series, it, this particular lecture series has become possible, these yesterday and today's lecture, as I mentioned yesterday, has become possible because of one person, that is Professor Mutin Saur, who has been behind and who has worked like, as a faculty of University of Hyderabad, he has helped us to organize this event at University of Hyderabad. Thank you, Mutin Professor Ramaya, to introduce the guest. Thank you very much, sir. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Aparogaru, Madam Eva Maria, and Professor Erwin Neher, the distinguished German guests, the distinguished academicians and industry people coming from various academic and research institutions and industry from Hyderabad deans, heads, and faculty of the various schools at the University of Hyderabad, Professor Mrityunjai Sao, the director of Kalinga Institute of Industrial Technology, who is instrumental in bringing the German guests to the University of Hyderabad, students, 
ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to this Hyderabad <coughs> lecture series organized by the University of Hyderabad with the help of IRDA funds. And today, we have a distinguished speaker with us, Professor Erwin Neher, and I am really honored to introduce him. It is indeed a great honor and privilege bestowed on me to introduce the speaker, and I hope I'll do the justice. Professor Neher was born on March 20th, 1944, in Landsberg, Bavaria, and raised in Buklo, 70 kilometers west of Munich. With physics background and influenced by cybernetics and Hodgkin Huxley theory of nerve excitation during school education, Dr. Neher went to study biophysics at the University of Wisconsin at Madison on a Fulbright scholarship in 1966. His master's project, directed by Professor Beaven, was an early attempt at producing molecular beams of macromolecules for mass spectrometry. In 1967, he returned to Munich and obtained his Dr. Rerum Naturalium in physics from the Institute of Technology, Munich. Subsequently, his quest to do research in biophysics in an area related to nerve excitation he is realized when he joined with Dr. H.D. Lux at the Max Planck Institute for Psychiatry. Here, he worked on voltage clamping in snail neurons and with single ion channel recording in artificial membranes. To circumvent space clamp problems, he used suction pipettes for local measurement of current density. At Dr. Lux laboratory, he met Dr. Bud Sackman, who had experience in the neuromuscular junction. Neher and Sackman collaborated, aiming at the measurement of single ion channel currents, which involved in developing and defining the patch clamp technique. This technique allows researchers to measure individual ion channels in the cell membrane to the level of picoamperes by eliminating the membrane electrical noise. The classical paper actually, which is titled Improved Patch Clamp Techniques for High Resolution Current Recording from Cells and Cell-Free Membrane patches, patches, which is published in 1981 in Archives of European Journal, has received 18,823 citations as on date. Until then, they were using a pipette, one thousandth of a millimeter in diameter fitted with an electrode to detect the flow of ions through a single channel in the cell membranes. Patch clamp technique allows the measurement of incredibly small electrical currents amounting to a pico ampere that pass through a single ion channel. These studies reveal the regulation of these ion channels for the movement of positive and negative ions, showed how the ion channels function, and has contributed to the understanding of the cellular mechanisms underlying several diseases, including diabetes and cystic fibrosis. The technique which records how a single channel molecule alters its shape and controls the flow of current within a time frame of a few millionth of a second is a path-breaking research in the area of ion channels that led them to bag the Nobel Prize in 1991 in physiology and medicine. Of course, after 1983, Dr. Neha's interest also shifted away from the channels themselves to processes they initiate inside, inside the cells, eventually leading to a cellular response like secretion of hormones and neurotransmitters. Professor Neha held several posts and obtained several laurels, and some of them which are coveted here are listed, and I'm speaking now about them. He held uh, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the laboratory of Dr. Stevens Laboratory at Yale University, Department of Physiology, New Haven, Connecticut. He is a Fairchild Scholar, California Institute of Technology, Pasadena, USA, in 1989, and served as the director of the Membrane Biophysics Department at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry, Göttingen, 
Germany during 83 to 2011. He won several awards and the most coveted among them include the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize, the highest honor awarded in German research, Lausa Gross Horowitz Prize from Columbia University, Feldberg Award from Feldberg Foundation, Feria Research Award Lecture from Feria Research Foundation, Harold Lamport Award from the New York Academy of Sciences, Spencer Award from Columbia University, Geithner Award from Toronto 1989, and Bristol Mayer's Quib Research Award from New York, Gerard Price, American Neuroscience Association. He was conferred also honorary doctorates from Dr. H.C. Lumberg University Centrum in 1988, from the University of Pavia in 2000, and honorary professor at the University of Göttingen in 1986. He was elected foreign member of the Royal Society in 1994. Madam Professor Eva Maria is also a very distinguished scientist in the areas of biochemistry and microbiology. She obtained her diploma in biology in 1974, earning a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Göttingen. Her thesis was regulation of the biosynthesis of polybeta hydroxybutyrate in alkaligens eutrophs, H60. She then worked in the same university as a staff scientist in 77, from 77 to 78, she also undertook postdoctoral research at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in the Molecular De Biology Department of Göttingen. While at the Charles Stevens Laboratory at Yale University for postdoctoral work, Dr. Maria met Professor Edwin Neher, and she worked in Neha's Eng Investigations Lab and married him on 26 December 78. She was a staff scientist at the Institute of Phys Physiological Chemistry at the George August University. She also taught experimental courses in chemistry and biology at the Free Waldorf School, Göttingen. Later in 2000, she founded XLab, an experimental laboratory for the youth bridging the gap between high school and university. She has been its managing director, managing and executive director since 2004. I welcome both of them. And ion channels are the key mediators of external chemistry and internal biology. In the context, whether it is chemistry or biology that is important between people to bring them closer or away from each other, I would say ion channels are a kind of bridge between ambience and cellular and molecular signaling. It's a very fascinating to determine how the chemistry of the environment influences the physics or generation of electrical signals, which in turn influence biology. This is how biology, which is started as a hobby, has grown into an interdisciplinary science. With these few words, I yeah. would welcome once again the guests. I now request Professor Erwin Maher to deliver his talk. Okay. Wow. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, dear Professor Ramaya, dear um, Mr. Vice Chancellor, uh, students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to give a lecture as part of this uh, distinguished series, and it's a pleasure to be to learn about the research on one of the top universities of this country. So my topic, ion channels, is something which fascinated me from high school days, as Professor Ramayal already uh, pointed out. Uh, 
in order to convey a little bit of this fascination, let me show you a few historical slides to start with. Um, okay. And of course, talking about the history, uh, now I think you can also hear me from this microphone. Okay. So, um, talk about the history of bioelectricity that has to start with the famous one second yeah with uh, uh, Luigi Galvani and Alessandro Volta two famous Italian scientists who um, more than 200 years ago found out that uh, you can stimulate nerve of frog and make it to switch uh, which was a phenomenon which was very exciting for uh, people at this time and which started lots of investigations into what was considered to be bioelectricity. Now, 100 years later, the famous Spanish neuroanatomist Ramon y Cajal showed us in his beautiful drawing that the nervous system is a filigree network of what we now call neurons. Um, today, we know that our brain is a network of about 10 to the 12th of such neurons, which are connected with each other by synapses. Each neuron, uh, on average, receiving input from 10,000 other ones. Um, Ramon y Cajal already had a good idea about signal flow in the central nervous systems. If you look closely at his drawings, you see in many places these little arrows, which actually indicate what he thought was the flow of signals. And we must say today that although all his ideas originated just from looking through the microscope at dead and fixed tissue, he was almost mostly right. Of course, he didn't know at this time what these signals were. but. Around the same time, a, a physiologist in Berlin, Julius Bernstein, built this machine and recorded uh, for the first time very short-lived signals, which we now know are so-called action potentials or nerve impulses. Uh, he recorded these at the cut end of nerve and muscle, you know, and could show that there are these electrical changes which happen on the millisecond time scale or sub-millisecond time scale. He also developed what's called his membrane theory, namely the idea that the electrical signals originate at the membrane of neurons of cells which surrounds every cell uh, in a tight way so that it separates electrically the inside of the cell relative to the outside. And his theory stated that uh, the electrical signals you see and which propagate through the nervous system are actually generated at this membrane. This was a very important concept for subsequent work. So 50 years later, in 1952, British physiologists Hodgkin and Huxley uh, published their famous work about the action potential, um, showing that it actually is a electrical wave which propagates along the nerve fiber, nerve fibers being a hollow cylinder of membrane. And they were able to reach these conclusions by working on the squid, uh, which was known to have a giant nerve fiber, a membrane cylinder of about almost one millimeter uh, thick, where they could insert wires longitudinally into it and record currents flowing through the membrane upon uh, applying a voltage to the, um, uh, to the membrane. And they could show that applying such voltages elicited currents which were uh, carried by sodium ions and by potassium ions. And 
they separated these two components by ionic substitutions uh, and could show that uh, the sodium currents uh, were short surges of invert current upon depolarization, whereas potassium currents were switched on in a delayed way, but uh, persisted. And then casting these time courses into differential equations, uh, they could actually demonstrate that a membrane with these properties um, um, separating a conductor inside from a conductor outside would generate electrical waves which propagate along uh, the axon, along this cylinder of membrane. So this was the state of knowledge when I got interested in it and as a, as a student as a, uh, wanting to do a PhD project entered the laboratory of Dieter Lux, a um, very well-known electrophysiologist. So uh, what you see here is actually a recording from my own thesis, which I think illustrates beautifully this concept of electrical excitability as worked out by Hodgkin Huxley. Namely, uh, I mean, in my thesis, I worked with conventional microelectrodes, uh, very small glass pipettes pushed into the soma of cells. In the case of my thesis, it was um, a giant neurons of snails, a garden snail. So I recorded the potential inside relative to outside, which is uh, at rest, as you I'm sure you know from basic uh, electrophysiology, has a resting potential of about minus 60, minus 70 millivolts. If you then depolarize uh, the cell by injecting positive current, you um, get a slowly developing a positive uh, a change in voltage, which after stop of the excitation um, drops back to uh, basal levels. However, if you surpass a certain threshold, then this phenomenon sets in, described by Hodgkin Huxley, namely due to the depolarization, a surge uh, of invert current into the um, uh, a cell which makes it positive, followed by a delayed outward current. Though this phenomenon at that time was understood on the macroscopic level, you know, as a consequence of changes of permeability changes. However, the big question at this time was what is the molecular mechanism of these permeability changes? There were many ideas in the literature. Of course, the idea of Hodgkin Huxley that there are gates which switch currents, you know, which suggest that there might be pores in the membrane which actually open and close. But there were competing ideas. Um, uh, it was known that these permeability changes are very specific for ions, certain ions, sodium, potassium. And the only mechanisms known with such high uh, um, 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 specificity were carrier-mediated uh, uh, currents, uh, uh, such as Currents mediated by, by valinomycin, a very specific carrier for potassium, which carries one potassium ions at a time uh, across the membrane. There were ideas that there may be phase changes in the membrane, in the lipids, you know. And um, uh, we discussed these ideas uh, um, in detail. Uh, and at one time, Bert Zackmann, who was doing uh, his PhD at the same time in the same institute and myself decided that we wanted to prove the original Hodgkin-Huxley concept of pores by just recording current sufficiently with sufficiently high resolution that we would be able to demonstrate step-like changes in current when these channels, these pores, open and close, which was of course expected to happen in a discrete manner. Uh, but there was a problem. I mean, uh, from some circumstantial evidence, we knew that the currents to be expected should be in the pico amp range, in the range of 10 to the minus 12 ampere. Now, to give you an idea about this order of magnitude, uh, there is this arrow which is supposed to represent the quantity current in logarithmic terms. And you know that typically current flowing 
in the light bulb are around an ampere. Um, uh, however, currents in electronic circuits are typically only 1,000, a milliamp, you know. But these are also currents which you found, which you can find in living systems, but only in very special ones like the switch I and axon. Typical currents in electrical tissue are still ordered by three orders of magnitude, the microamp range. Uh, these are currents as they are elicited by the nerve in the muscle, when the nerve signals to the muscle that it should contract, uh, elicited by the opening of the neuromuscular transmitter uh, acetylcholine. We know that these currents are made up of so-called miniature currents, which are currents flowing in response to a single transmitter containing vesicle being uh, releasing its transmitter, its acetylcholine, towards the muscle membrane. And uh, now we know that these currents, again, are made up of single channel currents in the pico amp range, uh, 1,000 times smaller, 10 to the minus 12. Now, the problem was that all methods available for recording electrical currents in biological tissue had an intrinsic noise of a, of a few tenths of a nanoamp, 100 times larger than the pico amp current, which we wanted to measure. So we had to come up with a new idea, with a new technique, you know. And um, this resulted what's now known to be the patch clamp technique. Unfortunately, uh, some panel shifted here. It's written down below, patch clamp technique. The name comes from the fact that uh, the technique consists of the basic idea of the technique is not to push uh, microelectrodes into the cell, but to place a microelectrode, a, 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 a micro glass pipette, touchingly onto the surface of the cell, trying to insulate a little patch of membrane for the electrical measurement with the underlying idea that in case there is an ion channel, a pore switching on this little patch, opening and closing. If we apply a voltage across there, connect this whole assembly to a amplifier, we should be able to record uh, these uh, um, uh, tiny currents. Um, and actually, after just two years or so of experimentation, we arrived at a um, uh, a state where we could first see these kind of step-like step changes. Now, this is not electrical ex excitability. This is currents elicited by the neuromuscular transmitter, acetylcholine, which was contained in the pipette in this experiment, um, 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 opening so-called acetylcholine-activated currents. Now, the key to the success was recognizing uh, that as you can find in electronics textbooks, that each electrical measurement uh, is confounded by the so-called transistor, transistor noise, or, um, um, uh, uh, well, just the noise uh, resulting from the fact that electronic charges, being electrons or ions, are quantal in nature. This leads to so-called Johnson noise or resistor noise, which is given by this equation. And you can see that uh, the uh, resistor noise is the, la the smaller, the larger the resistor or the impedance of the signal source. So just solving this equation for how high a, a, a signal impedance you need in order to have say, uh, current recording on the pico uh, a scale, you find, say, putting in a bandwidth of, of a kilohertz or so, that the impedance of the signal source has to be hundreds of megaohms or higher. And the problem is that by just placing a pipette onto a cell, you never get such high uh, uh, resistance because there is always a kind of a um, uh, 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 aqueous um, uh, leak between the pipette and the membrane. 
So the big problem was to prevent this leak and to, to increase the um, uh, signal impedance to the point that you reach hundreds of megohms of um, a seal. So finally, we succeeded in another step forward in the, uh, around 1980 to achieve very high steel resistances in the gigaohm range. And this allowed us to then record these uh, current changes in very good time resolution. Now, as I mentioned, this uh, first recordings were obtained on the neuromuscular junction, on the membrane of frog muscle cells. Uh, um, at, this, at the same time, biochemistry had advanced to the point that the so-called acetylcholine receptor could be extracted by biochemists as a membrane protein, characterized as a membrane protein. It turned out that the uh, acetylcholine receptor is a pentameric pro uh, a membrane protein with binding sites for acetylcholine. And obviously what happens when acetylcholine binds to this receptor, uh, then the uh, a protein undergoes a conformational change, opening an ionic pathway uh, to let um, ions uh, enter the cell. So these kind of records, more or less, were the first records where actually one could watch a biological macromolecule uh, do conformational changes in real time. Now, with the improved resolution, we could also return to the original question, namely of electrical excitability, uh, what's the basis of Hodgkin and Huxley, and this was done uh, together with uh, Fred Sigwars, who joined the lab as a, as a postdoc. He did an experiment on another type of muscle which has high electrical excitability and could show that when depolarizing this muscle, he could see upon repeated trials, repeated sweeps, uh, uh, these uh, inward blips of current happening primarily shortly after uh, s switching on the uh, electrical stimulation. And taking the ensemble average of many of such uh, currents, he could show that actually the mean current was a transient inward current, just the same as Hodgkin Huxley had shown originally on the squid uh, giant exon. Now with these two type of measurements, uh, the proof was established that both electrical and chemical excitability is mediated by this discreetly switching ion channels. Okay, so this was what we aimed at and what we achieved around 1980. Um, what comes in the rest of my lecture is actually not our own work, but the work by hundreds of laboratories worldwide who adopted our techniques and uh, came up with a number of surprises about ion channels. The first surprise was uh, that ion channels are actually not limited to what's called electrically excitable tissue, like nerve, muscle, some kind of neuroendocrine cells, but that uh, uh, a huge number of different types of ion channels fulfills uh, various tasks in different cell types. So a number of them are listed here, but this is just an um, uh, excerpt I could uh, produce a uh, uh, list with hundreds of entries. Okay, the second, well, the, uh, just to give you an example of the kind of multitude of different ion channels, I have here this example from the regulation of the heartbeat. Um, in the heart, in heart cardiomyocytes, you have action potentials, somewhat like nerve action potentials. However, here in the ventricle of the heart, you have an action potential with a very broad shoulder in order to allow the heart, give the heart enough uh, time to contract. And uh, as in the nerve, the upstroke of this action potential is carried by sodium ions, but what's shown here is a number of potassium 
currents, different types of potassium channels, which contribute to the fine regulation of the shape of this hard uh, 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 action potential. And uh, you, you can see there are listed here 10 different uh, kinds of potassium channels. And in the ventricle, these four types listed here contribute potassium currents with their specific time courses. Differently, different regulation is in the atrium, where these currents contribute relatively little, but another uh, collection of different types of potassium channels uh, uh, um, uh, makes the atrial action potential to be finely regulated also by hormonal influences. Um, OK, so the other, the next surprise was that ion channels are prime targets for pharmaca. This actually was not so big a uh, surprise because there had been empirical knowledge accumulated about um, so-called calcium antagonists, substances which antagonize the inflow of um, uh, calcium in the heart and also in the, in the, in the blood vessels. And um, this is an example uh, of the action of one of these calcium antagonists, nitrindipine. It's a slide given to me by Harald Reuter, a pharmacologist from Bern, Switzerland, uh, who was very lucky uh, working on cardiomyocytes that in some cases he actually had a, a patch with just one channel of a very particular type, namely a calcium, a voltage-dependent uh, channel carrying calcium current. And when he depolarized uh, this uh, uh, a patch of membrane, then he noticed that this channel just flickered open and closed in very rapid succession. Uh, this was an in control. Under the influence of this calcium antagonist, nitrendipine, openings were much more rare current was much more, uh, the channel was much more reluctant to open, so that you had only occasional little blips, and uh, correspondingly, on average, a very much smaller inflow of calcium, reducing the contraction power of the cardiomyocytes, and also reducing the tone on the blood vessels, because such channels also occur on in the endothelial cells of the blood vessels. Um, just a few more examples of drugs acting on channels. One is Vimentine, which is the second most prescribed drug for ameliorating the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. It is not a cure for Alzheimer's disease, but uh, patients taking it somehow can better cope with the consequences of Alzheimer's disease. And it is turned out to be a blocker of NMDA type glutamate channels. Glutamate uh, channels are one of the major excitatory channels in the brain, in the, in the synapses of the brain. And uh, the substance blocks uh, one specific subtype of such glutamate channels. Another example is uh, uh, VX77, a compound. Um, um, uh, which was found to be an activator of uh, a transporter protein for chloride, which is dysfunctional in certain forms of um, cystic fibrosis. And this turned into an FDA-approved drug uh, for this disease, which is very helpful. Unfortunately, only for a very, very small fraction of patients who have specific mutations in this uh, channel. And that's why it's called a genotype-specific uh, uh, medicine. So this brings me to the third surprise, namely that ion channels um, are the causes or defect, defects in ion channels, mutations in ion channels are the causes for a number of hereditary diseases. Um, again, a few of them are listed here, but uh, as in the case of drug targets, I could list, I could list hundreds of different uh, uh, diseases. This is not surprising because 
almost 200 of our 30,000 genes code for ion channels. And um, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Let me, uh, let me uh, say a few more words on this specific case of the cardio cardiology uh, um, uh, regulation. Now, there is this um, uh, cardiac syndrome of a long QT syndrome, which means a prolonged uh, plateau phase of the uh, cardiac action potential. And um, this uh, Clinton syndrome can be uh, caused by very different dysfunctions of ion channels. Um, and this is quite uh, clear when understanding the mechanism here of this uh, prolonged uh, plateau phase of action potentials. As I mentioned already, there are many uh, different types of channels contributing. There is a short-lived sodium current. There is a longer-lived calcium current, which maintains the plateau at the same time uh, uh, provides for the influx of calcium into the uh, cardiomyocyte. And then at some point, when uh, potassium channels are switching on, the balance between influx and outflux uh, tips, and you get this repolarization. Now, the time point when this happens can be shifted in two ways. It can be either um, uh, prolonged by a gain of function in the influx pathway, and this has been shown in, in uh, certain patients uh, that uh, there is mutation in the sodium current which prolongs, which uh, conveys to the sodium current a long tail, uh, which then leads to uh, delayed uh, repolarization. But the same phenomenon can also obtain by a loss of function mutation, namely if the counteracting potassium currents uh, 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 are smaller. And indeed, both of these phenomena can be um, observed um, um, uh, from cardiology. Uh, there are 12 congenital types of this syndrome uh, known, which clinically all look very similar. But as I pointed out, uh, the mechanisms underlying these different times are very different. So due to the uh, uh, um, a prominent role of ion channel regulation in uh, cardiac physiology. And due to the experience that many drug candidate molecules, which work out perfectly well uh, in animal models, fail in clinical studies due to arrhythmias in the heart and other cardiology problems, uh, there has been an early FDA ruling uh, that all candidate drug molecules for any target have to be tested against possible side effects on one of these potassium channels in the heart, namely the so-called HERC channel, which seems to be a sponge, they act like a sponge attracting, binding all kinds of molecules which would otherwise would be very suitable for as drug candidates, but then fail because they act on this channel. Uh, more recently, a new initiative by the FDA has been uh, started uh, preparing protocols for extensive testing of drugs for their influence on the cardiomyocytes. And this now includes five different types of ion channels which need to be tested, will, will be needed to be tested in the future before uh, FDA will approve for clinical tests and finally, of course, uh, uh, for, for the substance itself. Now, after this, let me finish with a somewhat amusing role, I think, of ion channels. And this refers to uh, thermal um, 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 uh, our, our sense of, of, uh, of, of heat, of warmth. And you know probably from 
physiology again, that in the skin of your, uh, 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 there are many different types of receptor organs, nerve endings, special, specialized structures, and so on. Among them, uh, ion channels localized in nerve endings, which open and close in response to temperature changes. And there are, in fact, quite a few of such channels, all of them from a type, a family of uh, channels which have not been known before the advent of patch clamp. It required, the very sensitive methods uh, to measure currents in order to find these uh, kind of background channels which act in the resting state, you know, and th they're all uh, from this so-called TRP family. Uh, TRP stands for transient resistor, um, uh, transient receptor potential. They were first characterized as parts of the light transduction pathway in uh, 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 Drosophila vision. Uh, so a number of these are temperature sensitive. Some of them act in the temperature range of the very cold between, so this, for instance, this TRPA1 uh, switches on in, uh, and off uh, uh, between 0 and 10 degrees. On the other end of the spectrum, there are channels which open only uh, with noxious heat, but together they cover the whole range of what we call physiological uh, temperatures. Now, the surprise comes or came when researchers found out that these channels not only open to in response uh, to temperature changes, but that also certain substances can influence their open close behavior. And uh, uh, no surprise, <laughs> if you look what are these substances, you find that capsaicin, the ingredient of our pep pepper, uh, activates this trip V1. On the other end of the spectrum, menthol, the ingredient of mint, opens uh, trip A1. And from this inside, of course, it's clear uh, why you feel hot or cold when you eat, or why you feel hot when you eat a spicy Indian food. <laughs> So with this, let me close, but not without mentioning once more that all the second half of my lecture was basically reporting on what happened to the field with the advent of the new technique. Uh, but the original studies, of course, were done together with Bert Sackmann, with whom I shared the Nobel Prize. And most of the very exciting developments in the early 1980s when uh, it turned out that there are so many different types of ion channels that uh, you could do many more things manipulating um, uh, channels, not just recording channels. And this was done with a number of postdocs who had joined our labs. First of all, Fred Sigworth, who did the uh, uh, electrical excitable cells. Alain Marty, who invented what's called the so-called whole cell, tight seal whole cell technique, a technique to uh, get access to the cell interior after rupturing of the patch, you know, which turned out to be very important. Owen Hamel, um, now a professor at Galveston, who found out that you could remove patches from cells so that you could study uh, ion channels in isolation with uh, uh, good access of active compounds from the inside and the outside. Um, so all of this then was a collaborative effort, and I am happy to acknowledge the contributions of these people. Thank you for your uh, attention. Let us put our hands together to thank
Professor. for this wonderful lecture now. He has agreed to address a few questions. Maybe I will leave it to the floor. First opportunity to the guests, and next opportunity to the insiders. Uh, professor, I'm a physician. I have a great interest in pharmacology throughout my career. And uh, thank you for the great work and uh, being here in Hyderabad. My question to you is, in the current era of drug development that is happening, purely rooted in molecular biology, and we all understand the current day work, which is rooted on inflammatory mediators, whether you take TNF-alpha or interleukins and all of those things. If perhaps in history, if these were discovered back in the times when you're working on the ion channels, do you think that the entire magnitude and the science of ion channels would have been submerged? Or may other way of understanding is, what is the relationship of the ion channels mm -hmm. to the new discoveries in molecular biology? And what do you and how do you see the future yeah. drug yeah. development? Yeah. Well, I think uh, the future of drug development will consist of two flows, you know. One is the flow of information about individual targets, drug targets. Um, and the other flow is how uh, then components isolated, acting on individual drug targets, act together, you know, to give a, a formulation of medicine which goes beyond the single component medicine. Uh, and of course, we have many examples how um, modern research can um, uh, contribute to finding new drugs. I mean, the say the example I um, uh, uh, showed here on the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator is uh, a, um, I would say, success story, which started by, uh, or one contribution of this was the isolation of the, or the, the, the um, um, uh, characterization of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator as a protein which has very complex properties, you know, ATP binding being a, either a transporter for chloride or a channel for chloride, very complicated physiology, and then finding molecules which boost the um, um, uh, function of this transmembrane regulator. In cases there are certain mutations which uh, uh, um, uh, deteriorate its, its normal action, you know? And I can imagine by just uh, finding uh, drug targets, finding molecules which act on it, being able to characterize the molecular action, uh, being able then to see how um, dysfunctions, restored functions, uh, on the molecular level uh, turn into functional changes on the cellular level, and finally uh, uh, translating into clinical symptoms that will tell us a lot about human biology, you see? Um, so uh, particularly recent work on isogenic cell lines derived from human patients, you know, where you can have cell lines carrying the disease mutation, and then you, by cytorechnogenesis, you correct this. Now you have two cell lines, so-called isogenic cell lines, one carrying the disease, the other one not. Uh, you can compare uh, things from on this exactly the same genetic background, diseased versus normal, 
on the molecular level, on the cellular level, on the clinical outcome. And there are hundreds of different genes, channel uh, genes, known to, to be mutated in certain diseases, you know. For each of, uh, say, a, a clinically defined hereditary disease, there are, uh, for many of these, there are uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 different mutations known, leading to clinically similar but slightly different outcomes. I think studying this whole wealth of uh, possible information there on human cell lines will tell us a lot about human biology, which in the end will uh, give much better predictions for possible clinical outcomes of drug candidate molecules than animal models, you know? Dr. Mohandas here, first of all. Thank you very much for an exciting talk. Uh, almost all the cells in our body have this ion channels, as you mentioned, and they influence almost all the body functions, including thinking and digestion and things like that. Ion movement happens under the field of electric field and that you talked about. Would you, what is your opinion about the effect of magnetic field on ionic channels and current? If you apply high yeah. magnetic field, yeah. would the ion channels start functioning differently? Uh, no, I'm not aware of any work. Of course, I mean, you uh, would expect from physical grounds that sufficiently high magnetic fields uh, should influence any current, you know. Uh, but uh, given the length scale you know, of uh, uh, um, uh, flow across channels, um, it seems that just the orders of magnitude needed for such effects are not reached in normal life. You know? Even, I mean, even um, um, uh, people going into the um, 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 magnetic resonance scanners, you know, experiencing very high fields, uh, don't have cons cognitive consequences, you know. We, so we, we don't know if they have consequences because we, uh, we are keeping them only for a brief period, so we yeah, don't yeah, know yeah, if yeah, they have yeah, consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. of, of course, uh, there, there, there may be uh, uh, long-lasting consequences, but, but I think from, from, at least from cellular studies, there is no evidence about that, you know, and also from purely physics consideration, um, um, I think the field strength required would be much higher, you know, than what's currently reached. Of course, there are say, um, certain phenomena, um, uh, say the, the uh, localization uh, of birds, you know, is known to be dependent on um, um, a magnetic field, but this is mediated probably by very specialized proteins which contain um, um, metal centers or so, which, which are uh, special for uh, um, uh, sensing uh, sensing magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fantasia. I thank University of Hyderabad for giving this great opportunity to us, and thank you so much for your lecture, sir. My small question is. Where do your great ideas come from? Pardon? What? Where do your great ideas come from? Uh, Where do you get these great ideas? <laughs> is the question. I, th I, I thought I explained this, you know, <laughs> that <laughs> the uh, Hodgkin Huxley was kind of inspiration, you know, and um, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it was such a great idea to put a glass pipette onto the surface. Uh, I think we were just very lucky that it worked, you know? <laughs> and we were very lucky that uh, once it worked so well, it turned out that there are so many different types of channels. Mm -hmm. But um, I think 
that uh, one of the prerequisites to have great ideas, to find solutions, is a very uh, elaborate curiosity, you know, which makes you keep thinking about your problem, trying different approaches, trying to live, to look at the given problem from all possible sides, you know, and just keep on. I mean, we didn't see our currents the first time we tried, <laughs> but it required some kind of persistence. It required some kind of thinking about what's the basis of the failure, why um, just placing the pipe on the cell doesn't immediately show channels, that you need this high, uh, uh, this, this very high quality seal, very high quality contact between the pipette and the membrane, and working towards this goal uh, makes you finally succeed. Thank you, sir. Yes. I'm professor of physiology. Uh, it was a great lecture which we teach to under, uh, undergraduate students also on the patch clamp technique. They're very excited about it. My question is, have you found any relevance in uh, malignancy in cancer, the ion channels, anything <coughs> going wrong here? Well, uh, I have not, you know. I mean, I left the field of ion channels about 20 years ago and specialized on uh, neuro, uh, 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 synaptic transmission, release of uh, uh, transmitters. But colleagues of mine okay. um, uh, worked um, in the cancer field and found out many links. Okay. Okay. You know, on the one hand, there is this one type of cardiac channels, which was studied by my friend Walter Stümer, yeah. who showed that um, one of these uh, channels, which which um, is uh, expressed uh, normally in the heart, if it's expressed ectopically in other tissues, okay. it creates um, okay. uh, tumors. You know, and and so the the the. Um, uh, t turned out to be a good diagnostic tool, okay. uh, expression of this channel in non-cardiac non, non tissue as a, as a marker for tumors. Uh, then a number of colleagues are looking at uh, the role of uh, uh, certain calcium influx channels, ICRAC, and one of some of these TRIP channels okay. uh, as uh, um, uh, with respect to their roles in cell cycle regulation mm -hmm. and, and in some Cancers, uh, the expression of these of these uh, channels is either increased or decreased, you know, and and um, so there is definitely a role of um, uh, channels in cancer. But I think this is just due to the fact that cancers develop all kinds of tricks to overcome the immune defense, and so you can find mutations in any signaling. Uh, yeah. um, a p a part of yeah. of the of the of the genome, you know, yeah. including channels. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Hyderabad. My question is: Is there any crosstalk between the GPCR modifiers into the ion channel modifiers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In drug discovery, at least. Uh, what what modifiers the, the G protein coupled receptors agonist yeah. and antagonist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do yeah, they yeah. have any crosstalk with the ion channel modifiers? Uh, 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 what kind of modifiers? Do oh, you agonist and antagonist. Any one of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there are many GPCRs which act like uh, 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 neurotransmitter receptors. Yeah. The the meta so-called metapotropic glutamate receptors are. Receptors for the neurotransmitter glutamate, you know, which which then triggers, I mean, the binding of glutamate uh, to these metapotropic uh, uh, channels triggers whole cascades of intracellular signaling. Um, uh, uh, say for for uh, also uh, the muscarinic cholinergic okay. receptors. Uh, there are um, uh, uh, five subtypes, you know, so you can find any kind of uh, second messenger pathway being influenced by one or the other of these 
of, of, of these um, metabolic glutamate receptors or muscarinic. And there are many, many more. Can I ask you another one? May I ask this last one? Uh, are there nil the way you predicted the thermal and the chemical induced? Keep the microphone closer. Oh, yeah. Uh, are there any chemical, since you mentioned already about the chemical and thermal uh, variations in these uh, ion channels, are there any light induced uh, ion channels that modify their activity? Light uh, induced? Light induced. Well, I mean, uh, naturally th there are uh, not so many, but uh, uh, in recent years, this family of so called channel rhodopsins mm -hmm. was uh, discovered which uh, are rhodopsins um, which react to light, but the reaction will be the opening of a, of a channel. And this turned into this very popular field of so-called optogenetics. You know, people now express these light-activated channels in various parts of the brain, everywhere the tissue, so to control uh, nervous activity by light, and, and this is a area of research which is expanding rapidly, you know, and uh, uh, contributes a lot to understanding of. Uh, Thank you very much. There, there are a couple of hands on the uh, back. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Professor, I, I just have a small question to a big problem. Uh, we all are aware of the multi drug resistance problem. So most of the microorganisms that are effluxing out, like the efflux pumps, are involved in the. Uh, multi drug resistance. Mm -hmm. So, do you have a, out of the, like uh, now we are more than 50 years in the field? So, do you have a best solution for this problem? For multi drug resistance? Yes. No. <laughs> 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 no, no. I mean, I've, I've not worked on this. And, um, well, I mean, multi drug resistance is, is probably n not a phenomenon which relates to a single kind of signal, you know, but just to a combination of mutations and things which, n which, which knocks out a number of possible drug targets, you know, but I've never worked on this field and I'm no specific knowledge on it. Uh, thank you for the nice lecture. Uh, I just need a comment. All the ion channels are for, so far is for cations. How do you think about anion does the anion uh, yes. related ion channels? Yeah. No, no, I mean, there are many anion uh, uh, specific channels known. You know, I mean, uh, the original work on the electrical excitability was sodium, potassium, calcium cations. But subsequently, um, the list of channels discovered which carry anions is very long, you no? Know? I mean, the, they, this, um, uh, the example I showed about the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator is a chloride transporter or channel, depending on the conditions. Um, many of the um, 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 inhibitory neuro um, um, uh, 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 transmitters are opening chloride channels. GABA, GABA, GABA for instance, glycine is opening uh, chloride channels to hyperpolarize the membrane. Thank you. One girl wanted to ask, uh, give her a chance yeah, first. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk. Actually, I have some doubt about. Actually, uh, my topic is different. Uh, you are talking about uh, natural proteins. What is your opinion uh, about uh, nat synthetic ion channels in drug delivery? Synthetic ion channels in yeah. drug delivery. In drug delivery. Uh, synthetic ion channels, which type? Uh, any means for cation or anion, any kind of synthetic ion channel, just yeah. like uh, carbon nanotube, uh, anything, just like cyclodextrin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, I'm a little bit skeptical about the carbon nanotubes. You know, I mean, there has, has been work uh, published in prominent journals um, about recording with carbon nanotubes, you know, but uh, for me, these experiments have never been very convincing. Now, 
Um, synthetic pores, of course, play a big role in nanopore sequencing, you know, but I'm not so much aware of roles of synthetic channels uh, in drug delivery. So. Thank you. Okay. There was one more. Somebody raised my hand there. Hmm? No. No? No. No more? Okay. Professor Ramaya. Sir, are there cell specific, I mean, there must be cell specific channels and also general channels. Also? General. General channels, yeah, yeah. And my question is now whether the general channels are they different from cell type to cell type in their functioning? I see. Or well, they have a conserved uh, structure mm -hmm. and function? Mm -hmm. No, of course. I mean, it depends on the cell type. Which of the 200 channels in the gen uh, channel genes are expressed? You know, um, and th there are certainly a number of housekeeping channels which are involved in cell volume regulation, which all uh, cells need, you know. Um, um, but I don't think there is some kind of a rule, you know. But this is similar to... But the these uh, ones which are maintaining, I mean, which are ion channels maintain, uh, maintaining the basic cell functions, mm -hmm whether their efficiency of functioning, would it be dependent on the ambience or uh, I see. whether it is regulated by some small changes in their structure and function? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, there is the example of the so-called piezo channels, which are channels which uh, regulate or which sense membrane stress, you know, and and, and these, these channels have been shown to be basically expressed everywhere, you know, in, in, in each cells. Um, so it's just an example. And on, on the other end, of course, there are very specific channels like the voltage dependent sodium channels, which are right. restricted to, uh, to excitable tissue, you know. But as I, as I said, I don't think there is kind of a rule. You know? Okay. Sir, one last question. Yes, last question. I think the one one boy want to ask something. So I was waiting. Sir, uh, thank you, sir, for the lecture. So as you mentioned, many diseases are there due to um, defect in ion channels. So have 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 you studied uh, different uh, diseases in plants? So I'm from plant biology. That's why I I'm asking. I see. So have you studied in uh, different diseases and uh, different effect of uh, drugs on that ion channels? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for sure, I haven't studied <laughs> uh, disease channels in plants. And I must say, I, I have done work on plants recently with, uh, together with a, with a, with a colleague, uh, Rainer Hedrich from Würzburg. Um, but but and and so uh, so I have been in contact with plant cell research, but I'm not aware of the specific link between channels and plant diseases. You know, uh, I would just have to go into the literature and look around. Uh, I'm I'm sure in the vast literature on regulation of ion channels and all these phosphorylation mechanisms which, which regulate ion channels in plant cells, that there must be uh, cases relating to plant diseases. So, but. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, sir, as you said, when you discovered it, uh, it was quite unanticipated that these ion channels had a important uh, effect on, the, uh, eff impo were very important for the drug use, or important for drugs. So b having made this discovery, how far you de do you think that uh, there's a moral responsibility on the scientists like you and other, yeah. uh, uh, like uh, uh, that how your discovery is being used? And how far do you find that over a long journey, uh, you have been successful on controlling uh, mm -hmm. how your discovery has been put in the real practical use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, of course, I mean, scientists are responsible for uh, 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 what they do, the consequence of their work. They are responsible for using the funds which are provided by uh, society in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way. But of course, uh, sci scientists are not, 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 not alone. There is a huge community of scientists, and there is kind of job sharing between scientists. And, and I uh, think that my special uh, abilities are more on the side of making um, of creating basic knowledge, you know, and um, of course, any new basic knowledge uh, should be checked for possible applications, you know. Uh, but but as I said, I'm not alone. I I hope that um, uh, other scientists take up uh, whatever we find out in new basic knowledge. And I mean, as the example of ion channel research shows, I mean we did our work 30 years ago, which led to this breakthrough in measurement technology. And uh, 30 years later, there are plenty of practical consequences, uh, um, um, practical applications. Um, but it took a long time until this, this um, uh, translation of basic uh, 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 advances into 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 um, uh, practical things, and of course there is always this debate between should we do basic research, should we do applied research? I think the answer is we should de do both, you know, and be sure that there is the right mix between the two, because basic knowledge creates uh, basic research creates new knowledge, and it's always easier to find applications uh, for new knowledge um, relative to applications for old knowledge, because old knowledge has been looked at already by so many people from different angles, you know, that you must be very luck lucky to find something really new. However, if you have new knowledge, your chances are much better. OK, I think we uh, close the questions here. Mm -hmm. And let us do, uh, have a pleasant duty to felicitate our speaker. For this felicitation, I would like to request two more people to join me on the dais. One is Sri Sateji from IRDA, and also Professor Eva Maria onto the dais, please. I now request uh, Professor Naresh Babu to present vote of thanks. Eva, you can take seat. You can take your seat. So, on behalf of University of Hyderabad and School of Life Sciences, so uh, we would like to thank Professor Erwin Nehar for accepting our invitation and giving an inspiring and thought-provoking speech. 
on ion channels he delivered a brief history of ion channels and uh, ionopathies and the importance of ion channels in cardiomyopathies and cardiac functions and also he is in questioning he also said students and research scholars uh, sh they should think about the problem and uh, surrounding how to the curiosity to solve the problems that is most important to solve any biological problem or any problem related to the biological sciences and and also i would like to thank irda for insurance regulatory and development authority for setting up a, a grant corpus fund for organizing this kind of hyderabad lecture series and and also accepting to organize this event at a very short notice thank you sir and we would like to thank professor apparav padale and uh, is one of the vice chancellor is untiring efforts to bring the university to at eminent status and by bringing eminent scholars like uh, professor ervin nehar to university of hyderabad as a part of uh, hyderabad lecture series thank you sir <laughs> and we would like to thank dean our school of life sciences is always in forefront in organizing this kind of events and is very enthusiastic to organizing this kind of events and uh, we are very happy to have dean and thank you sir for coordinating this event <laughs> and we would this event wouldn't have been possible without the help of professor murtunjay saur kalinga institute of uh, industrial technology for bringing this ervin nehar to this university and uh, delivering this very important lecture on ion channels thank you sir and we would like to thank coordinator professor kv ramaya madhu babu and other student volunteers who went along the i mean couple of days ago we have a very short notice and they went through the caps and deliver the flyers to all over the all institutes across the city and we would like to thank the student volunteers who helped in organizing this event thank you <laughs> and would like to thank pro's office and dean's office and uh, other members who helped in organizing this event and in particular pranav who able to live streaming this event to to show the this event in across the university thank you sir <laughs> i hope i thanked everyone if i did. and i would like thanks the distinguished guests from outside of the university and other institutes and also faculty colleagues and students for making this event a grand success thank you one and all <laughs>